provisioning, VM provisioning, and it's a great way to manage configuration across environments as well. So, a little introduction uh, about both of us. Uh, Bust and Bastler. Uh, currently working at a tech startup here in Columbus called uh, Klarna. Um, previous experience uh, working as a systems engineer at uh, Verizon Wireless and previously uh, LexisNexis. Justin Miller. I uh, work as the uh, senior engineer on Hadoop and Cassandra at uh, IHOP Technologies now with Kudevi. Uh, I manage about 350 servers and three different clusters, each in uh, different geographic locations. Uh, I worked previously at Verizon Wireless with Weston for a number of years. So, uh, a little overview of what we're here to talk about today. sure if you're aware, um, the latest version, uh, version 6, this is actually the open source utility uh, that backs uh, Red Hat Satellite Sticks. Uh, previously, version 5 and below was uh, Spacewalk, but now they're using uh, Foreman and Catello as the uh, open source project. Um, so we'll kind of break this up into like three parts. So in part one, we'll actually talk just about the Foreman project. Uh, we'll give an overview of what it is why it's a really cool tool. Um, we'll actually do a demo of uh, post provisioning and we're, the demo is gonna include how uh, actually Justin's using it to uh, spin up his Hadoop nodes uh, uh, in his current work. Uh, so part two, we'll talk about the fellow. Uh, we'll give an overview of like what uh, things that it provides. And then I'll do a demo on um, some of the perks of having uh, host collections and Sort of a part three, it's only one slide, but we'll kind of explain how you can bring the two projects together or how they're actually brought together. You can automate everything from top to bottom in your infrastructure. Um, and then we'll also talk about some other awesome things that are provided, and, uh, some of the reasons why we think that this is a really cool uh, utility for people to use. Um, and then we will do a, everybody loves Docker, right? So um, what is Foreman? Foreman is an open source project. It helps uh, administrators manage servers through the lifecycle, provisioning bare metal server, provisioning on the AWS, Google, Google Compute, uh, managing configuration of those servers once they're provisioned, and uh, integration with Chef, Salt for current provisioning tools. There's even integration with Ansible for inventory. And a good, it's a good way to separate configuration by environment or by role permissions in, the, in that integration. So um, I use it personally for provisioning bare metal servers. That's how we got started at with the company. I was told 50 servers were going to arrive in my data center. I needed to get them online in three days. So I was highly motivated not to mount an ISO into every single one of them, go through the CentOS 7, you know, 6 installation process about 50 different times by myself. So I stopped in West and he told me about Foreman. And I did a demo, got it online, and found a way to set it up so when new servers arrived in my data center, they're plugged in, powered network, they're turned on, and they automatically set themselves up completely. I showed this to my boss, and he was pretty impressed too. So now um, I didn't really care at the time about configuration or company or location, all the extra stuff that it can do because I was the only one using it. But now it's going to be bubbling into the rest of the company and the other administrators, the Oracle people, the Ubuntu people, all of them are going to be up in the system. So now I need to make sure they can't touch my servers. So I'm really pleased by the ability to do class and the separation and configuration for Puppet. And it has deep Puppet integration. So when a server comes online, the initial configuration I have done is all done through Puppet immediately after installed. <coughs> 
uh, another benefit is audits all changes that ever happen. So if I have something, some administrator goes in and makes a change to an environment, and I'm not sure what happened, I have an audit change, audit track log of everything that changed, and it, cha it tracks puppet changes too. So if somebody doesn't go into the Etsy puppet modules directory and edit a file, they go through the UI, edit it. There's an inheritance structure built in, so I can say there's global inheritance where these say sudo, I want all core admins to have sudo, and then bubble down to Oracle servers, Oracle admins can also have sudo this command. It'll, I can do an inheritance tree through Puppet, through the web UI, and uh, I can see, I can really specify kind of permit permissions and see every change that those Oracle admins might do with their sudo permissions if I didn't access the web console. There's also a really awesome REST API, so anything you can do in the, in the web console, you can do through the REST API, so you can glue it together in all your scripts. There's a command line utility called hammer. If you add dash dash debug to the hammer commands, it will show you the REST API calls that it's doing to execute its commands. And there's a full dashboard system for all the public configuration where it'll tell you the systems that are out of compliance. There's also a dashboard system for the package management system for tracking errata, what's not in compliance. There's a security auditing module to make sure we were meeting our security compliance. It's pretty nice. And uh, so my, my favorite part of it for me is I can automate every level. So a new server comes in, it's plugged in, stands itself up. There's a plugin called Hook Scripts, so I can say after it's stood up, you can call a Python script to talk to the Cloudera API, which we use Cloudera to do. And it'll register itself as a data node and get roles pushed to it automatically. It allows me to manage servers on my own. So uh, how, how quickly does it take on average per server to set that up and register Cloudera? It takes about three hours because I'm, in it, I'm formatting about well, eight, eight, 12 eight terabyte disks, and that takes a while. But if there were no disks, it would be done in just you know, 20 minutes. <coughs> I have a video demo of me provisioning a virtual machine as, as if it was a physical device from me creating the VM, setting up. It's HP undiscovered. It's pushed, rules are pushed to it through uh, Foreman. It's pretty neat. Um, and the way bare metal provisioning works, if you don't have the pre rule set, so I don't want images to get pushed on servers that aren't data nodes, <coughs> right? Or a server that already has an LS on it. So I have rules that will detect puppet facts from a thin image that loads up initially. So I detect hardware model, I detect whether something's installed in it or not. And if it meets those, rules, it'll auto-provision. If not, it'll sit in a registered listening state in, in uh, Discover Hosts without installing anything. I can click on it, configure, and then click provision. Now I have full control of, of uh, what's getting image and what's not. It, uh, had, so the provisioning is really powerful for bare metal, but also it can talk to a number of cloud, cloud systems and hypervisor type systems. So, it has deep VMware integration. I can tie in my VMware server as a compute resource, and instead of me going and creating a VM, from here I can say, give me 10 more VMs, give me 10 Oracle servers. It'll go into get to vSphere, create the VMs, install Oracle on them, and it'll be online. The same is true for OpenStack, Google Compute, ties into EC2. I haven't messed with Overt, but I'm sure it works fine on there too. It's really, it's really good. Oh yeah, also supports Docker as compute resource, which is one of the few I've seen. One note about the, uh, the integration, if you delete a server from here, it will delete it out of VMware. We found that out when somebody deleted a production server about two weeks ago. <laughs> Confluence was deleted. Um, an another benefit of the architecture is they have something called smart proxies. So these are geographically independent servers that will talk back to your main format server. The benefit of that is um, it will mirror all repos. So we have one in each geographic site. All the packages we need to push over are automatically mirrored over. And when things need to install or update, they pull from that local, local server instead of going across the WAN. Um, it does 
also management of DHCP, um, DNS. DHCP is how it pushes out images for Pixie using TFTP. Um, there's a nice UI you can install to manage DHCP if you want to. You can also talk to Microsoft DHCP servers as an interim. So we already had some Microsoft DHCP servers, so I had to do a pass through for DHCP and DNS for my for my servers so they can get imaged. Um, yeah, this will also allow for cross site. So if you have a uh, performance server in one data center, it will better communicate in another data center. So it, it helps it better communicate cross sites. Oh, and uh, one note about security. So the way this stuff gets registered in the puppet, it's orchestrated by Foreman, so it'll install certificates when it registers. So the only way something can talk to the Foreman server is if it's got its certificate already authenticated had search push, push to it. So it's not like anything can just log in and start pulling all your public code or public modules down to show you your configuration. So this the system configuration management, the one that's built in, is Puppet. I initially wanted to use Ansible more because I was familiar with it, but I've since got more on board with Puppet. The, uh, the benefit is there's a ton of modules for Puppet. Easy to uh, have that whole class inheritance structure is really nice, and the other system administrators I worked with were already aware of Puppet, so it was easy to onboard the company to it. There's also native salt integration that you can install where it does as deep integration as Puppet. The uh, Ansible integration isn't as deep, you can, Ansible can use this as an inventory and pull facts from it, but uh, I use Ansible more for ad hoc stuff anyway. So I'll be, it's nice I can just say, hey, give me all the data nodes and install the Tusher package or change one config option without having to troll through all the puppet configuration. But the puppet configuration is nice to have too. The, the one good thing or bad thing about uh, Foreman, whether you look the way, whichever way you look at it, it comes, uh, it relies heavily on puppet for like monitoring and, and gathering system packs and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's already pre-installed straight out of the box. Oh, and uh, when I mentioned it, something will sit in the listening state, if it doesn't have provisioning rules listen, what it will do is load up a CentOS 7 thin image with Puppet installed over, over TFTP, and it'll up push all of its facts about the host into Foreman. So that's how it knows what your model is. It knows everything about that piece of hardware that Puppet would know about. And you can click in your discovered host and review those facts and use that to make decisions. Like, I have rules based on VLAN it comes up on and model on which site. That's how it knows which site it's on or if it's a data node or not. Sure, um, so the way you control which OS is installed, which Puppet server it registers with, and um, even the access control and Puppet configuration is done through something called host groups. Host groups can be subgroups of other host groups, so you can do multiple inheritance. Um, you can have a host group be assigned automatically with the discovery rules for bare metal provisioning. If you're using, if, if, if you're not pulling and you're pushing, aka you're talking to VMware or EC2, you can have that be predetermined by uh, host groups as well. So where you choose your host group ahead of time and push, and that's how it knows what to do. Uh, and then there's ability to use, to assign activation keys within a host group. So an activation key comes, comes in later when we talk about package management and content hosts. That's how all your yarn repositories are managed, which package you want to assign where, lifecycle management. And that's more the Catello piece. So that's where Foreman and Catello kind of start to come together. It's a very key uh, piece of automating your entire, your entire OS deployment and you know, getting it registered with the right public classes and uh, assigning to correct resources, because resources. And I mentioned, we mentioned earlier that you can see all your Puppet information on a core on a front dashboard, see which nodes are in compliance. Um, there's pretty graphs. It'll give you a history of all changes for per host if you want. Uh, there is one thing you you will probably want to do. I had to set the cron task that runs every 30 days to clear out old puppet reports because you're, if you don't do that, your server's going to get really slow. I found out after my server got really slow. Um, it ties into LDAP for authentication, so we use Active Directory to manage all authentication in the company, so I can just have AD groups set up for each pub, each different environment, and that's how people get added. I don't have to worry about adding users. That's when they get hired, they're putting their AD groups, 
HR handles all that, and all their access is not my problem, because I don't want to spend all day man managing the server either. Right, you can base the user management on uh, roles. So basically, if he and I worked on separate teams, he could keep my team out of uh, touching his form and stuff, and I could also keep his team out of uh, accidentally you know, doing something with my nodes. Yeah, which I, I think is really important, because I mean, just last week we had one of our AIX admins go in and edit a public configuration that she added one of our developers root key to all, all her servers. And uh, that would have really upset me if it got into the other nodes. PHI compliance. So we mentioned smart proxies. Here's kind of a good over, overview of the architecture. Smart proxies manage things like DNS, DHCP, local package management. Um, each one's a puppet CA, but it's a transparent puppet CA. It'll mirror the foreman server, and local, local nodes will automatically talk to that local puppet CA. And that's even nice, so if you were to lose communication between data centers, you still have your puppet CA there. You could technically log in and edit puppet files yourself in an emergency if you need to change some configuration, but I would highly recommend not doing that. I'm going to show you a video demo of what bare metal provision looks like with this lesson. So uh, I use Proxmox for some of my DNS because it's pretty and pretty sweet. That was wrong. Cool. So here's me just creating a VM. I would not normally use this to do VM management. This is simulating a bare metal server because I'd much rather use its compute VMware integration. So this is just a new server coming online in my Hadoop VLAN. And I set up a discovery rules to apply a host group provision to it to give it a five gig partition home directory and install the OS and update it. So you're gonna see that happen live, fresh server. Because I didn't believe it until I saw it either. Form and discovery fixing image pushed out over DHCP. I talked about thin image getting loaded, so that's happening right now. It's a CentOS 7 thin image. It'll start to discover all the facts, push them into Foreman. Foreman will see those facts and make a decision, push it back to the thin image, and you'll see it reboot again and receive a new image and start installing. It moves pretty quick. Um, it, it can move really quick because at each data center you have your smart proxy. I have my CentOS installation file so it's locally on each one and it automatically picks up the local one. The, uh, the plugin that lets me do this auto provision is called Form and Discovery. It's pretty easy to install, it's just one command. And configuring it with DHCP. Is it pre-installed? No, it's not pre-installed. Now, if you don't want to do auto discovery and you want to go in manually and put in a MAC address and map it, then you don't need to plug in. But my whole driver was to not have to do the MAC address thing because I had a uh, had a provisioning system already. What was it called? But it required me to go in and that was Kickstart. I forget what it's called. I had to go in and map MAC addresses manually, and it would have taken forever to get all the MAC addresses. Oh, uh, network configuration. So you can use DHCP, which is easy, but I can't use DHCP in my, my data minutes, so I can do IP pools, and it's where the IPs that are assigned out of that pool in Foreman. Have to go grab one of the available IPs and configure statically on the internet that IP address. At this point, does it know what the rules would be for the network configuration? Yeah, it does, and that was master host groups and discovery rules. <coughs> yeah, that's, that's like the, the beauty of having host groups. It's already predefined. And that's all discovery rules do. You set a list of facts equals whatever, and then the host assign host group. So how do you, how do you, I, I might have misread the mention, but how do you, how do you tell it that it's going to be a, a good book in this case? Oh, in this case, it's based on model of the hardware. So I, ah, okay. and VLAN. Got it. So what about the systems that you already had powered up? Right, so did you, did you discover those without having to reboot them? 
So I didn't really, I think there's a plug into that, but I didn't want it to auto discover those. So we're doing those in stages. To have something auto register in, you can just change its puppet server to the, to the performance server and do a puppet agent bash t update. It'll register in the puppet. It'll wait for a certificate <coughs> sign. I'll go in, sign a certificate, because I want to make sure nothing's auto registering. I don't want And then puppet agent t again. It'll just show up and upload all its inventory information to perform it. And we're doing a bit of a migration process with Satellite 6 because we were in, in, using just normal Puppet across the company without multiple environment support before. So we're trying to migrate, we're, we are migrating that into performance, environment aware, multi you know, class, with inheritance, Puppet environment. That's why I, the woman that updated the host key at the SH root key I told you about, it updated all of the other servers that weren't migrated. So now the developer can log in as root because any of our servers. For, for about three hours until she got slacked down. It was really upsetting because she went around our, our Git repo system, which we were using, which we use for the other puppet stuff, where you have to do a merge request in, and then we already had to prove it because it affects all servers. So just went in, she went around that and just edited it directly and pushed it. Very upsetting. <coughs> It was, yeah, malicious. I, I call it malicious, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being nice. We'll see if she still has a job next week. So you just mentioned you're going through a migration of Satellite 6 to Foreman. No, Satellite 6 is Foreman. So Satellite 6 is uh, Foreman and Catello combined. Right. So I already deployed it as like an appliance on my network for Hadoop. They liked what it was doing. So another administrator, because I'm already really busy, is doing the Satellite 6 deployment, and I'm kind of backing him up, and he's doing all that migration stuff. Plus he knows the non-Hadoop stuff, which actually makes us the most money. So I'll let him handle that important stuff, and if not, he can do me that messes it up. So, so is, there, is there any advantage to using the complete open source version of Foreman? over installing a Satellite 6 environment? Uh, the main advantage is that it's free. <laughs> but if, if you already <laughs> in a right. environment and already have If you can afford Satellite 6, totally get it instead. Because then you have full support, and there's even an extra plug-in that they'll push metrics from your nodes if you want them to, and to Red Hat, and they'll tell you about the healthier servers with analytics and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all pretty cool. And then if something breaks, you have somebody you can call. Because there's a lot of moving pieces going on here. There are no features that are not in Foreman that are in Satellite 6? Yeah. Other, other than those things, are there actually? No, it's the same code base. OK, so it's not It's not that big a difference. And obviously, it handles the registration, too. If you're running Red Hat, you know, it'll be your oh. subscription management. That's another good point. So the Red Hat repo management, you can hook in your Red Hat keys to, to Foreman, the to Catello. And if you do, it might jack up your licensing with Red Hat because we had the Satellite 6 license hooked in to manage all repos, and that same woman decided she was going to go in and register the keys for Red Hat, and it assigned all licenses onto our Foreman server, and it took us about three weeks to get all the keys assigned right back to Satellite in the right way. So it's literally the same case, so this, and you can't assign, you can't hook it up to Red Hat without a license key for Satellite, so it, it can mess up your licensing if you do that. So don't do it unless you're very confident. <laughs> Puppet, Puppet's used for building out exactly one server to another, right? So is there a way to handle things that aren't going to be the same, such as IP addresses and host names? Or do you guys have to go in after the fact and configure all the one-off stuff? It's injected into Puppet dynamically through, um, they call it a node, uh, node something node profiler, fire. node classifier, right? So all the, those IP pools I told you about, Foreman will inject all that stuff into the new classifier and then re register what's taken in its own database. Um, so yes, there is a way to inject those facts. And then in the class browser in Puppet, you can, it's like Ruby array list stuff I can override. So like I have my NTP servers all injected in the configuration for the NTP module. I had to do an array list that injects over that one piece of configuration of the module. But it works really well. It's dynamic. The new classifier thing is really cool. Like I can hit, so if I'm having an issue with like a kickstart, I can hit a site and it'll 
dynamically generate the Kickstarter on a static page for me to look at what was happening so I can troubleshoot. Because there's like five different pieces that come into generating the Kickstarter file. And I can do the same thing with the new classifier. I can go directly on the Foreman server, hit the new classifier, pass an X in, and it'll tell me all the public configuration that was able to apply. And do you have to have a specific plan for this, or does it know that, hey, it's a blank system coming up? And it knows it based do on it, and any systems that already are provisioned, you don't touch them. Right, it, it knows based off the rules I set. So if a system comes up and it doesn't meet the rules for pre-provisioning, which one of the rules is no OS, it'll just, it should boot off its disk and never hit the network card to boot up, but if it somehow, like the disk fails, and it hits the net to boot up, it'll just sit in an idling listening state at, as a discovered host informant if it's not already registered. If it's already registered informant, nothing will happen. So um, for my servers, I use Supermicros. There's an IP in my config command line tool. It's awesome. So I'll wait till the OS is installed, which would be the IP in my config tool using Puppet. And then I'll use Ansible to do ad hoc commands over SSH. But I could probably use Puppet too. I just, you know, I like to see it happen right away. So as you can see, our host is fully online. Um, the host name, you can set patterns based off, so that's, that's a little bit of a challenge. So I do patterns based off MAC address on the initial host name, and I eventually go back and change it, just because I'm trying to keep track of where my nodes are, so I'll put the rack name in there. Because when I bring 50 servers online, I don't, as far as when auto provision happens, I don't really know where they are, because they're all in the same VLAN. So I, I do go back and rename them. I'm trying to find a better way to, to do that. Because how do you know where your server's really at when they're all on? Other than just saying screw it and going off MAC address and the host name, and if something goes wrong, I'll go flag the light to the right PMI in front of the host and find it. But that's a bold move. Right. Yeah, so the demo that he just showed would be for like how you would do it. There is a little bit of interaction there, basically, you know, touching the server and turning it on. That's not a whole lot of interaction, um, but Foreman does support what's called unintended installation uh, for uh, over, rev, uh, and VMware. So basically, I could just, you know, yeah. no, not yet. Okay. In the future, open should as well. But, um, so basically, unintended installation, meaning that I can log into a Foreman and say, hey, I want to add it, I want to spin up a new select the, the VMware uh, compute resource, I can assign it the resources from there, and it will automatically create the VMs inside of either over VMware, wherever uh, the VM installation. So and delete them. And delete them. <laughs> <laughs> Be very careful, because if you delete it here, you're going to... You can turn that off. Though. Yeah, you can turn it off. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that all it is is a few button clicks inside a form that will actually handle bring up the actual VM inside of over rev and VMware. And also, the, uh, the Catello documentation is really horrible. So if you have a Red Hat account, I highly recommend using the Red Hat Satellite 6 documentation because it directly applies. Do you have to have any kind of plugins for VMware or over or anything which is stable over? Yeah, we work. So all you need is the, uh, for over and rev, you just need the API link. With the uh, uh, some sort of admin username and password, um, and with uh, VMware, all you need is the vSphere. Uh, yeah, or v sorry, vSphere admin account when you set up your compute resource. Oh, and from what the guy at work was saying, he's got more into the VMware stuff. You can do. You don't have to use like the root account in VMware. You can do like a lower account per mm -hmm. environment so that. I think you can do it per area too, per like class too. So that way, people that shouldn't be creating VMs in certain environments can, if that's a concern. Yeah, it's just deadlines for us. Enough privileges, I think, to power on the VM basically and create a VM. Okay, so I will talk about uh, the Catello portion of uh, this project. Uh, so. 
Prior to Satellite 6, uh, Catella and Forman were actually two separate projects. They, you could do a single installation of Catella, you could do a single installation of Forman. Um, until Satellite 6 came along, they decided to actually add uh, Catella as a plug-in into Forman so that they are actually now uh, one project. But you can still you can still install Forman without Catella, but you can install Catella without Forman. So Catella is basically content management. I'm sure any of you that have uh, previously used Satellite 5 and then had to switch to subscription manager, 